uh, right now, I am going to take us into the 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 panel that we're going to have on innovation in aviation. Um, so that that uh, concludes the, the demos that we're going to have today, and the panel that we're going to have. I'm I'm really excited. This is a fantastic group of of folks that uh, that can bring some interesting insights on trends as far as technologies go, but also sort of like what they're seeing in the sector, what, what they're seeing as the state of the industry. Um, so I'm really excited to, to um, introduce Chris Rundy. He is gonna be your moderator for this panel. He's the Director for Corporate Strategy and Innovation at Ross and Brozini. And um, I knew Chris when he was the Director for the uh, Airport Innovation Accelerator um, and uh, really excited to bring some new innovative technologies to the airport and airline sector. And he, and you can thank him and, uh, and other Chris on our panel for bringing you TSA PreCheck. So um, over to Chris. Thank you, Melissa. Um, yeah, you, you, it's fun to think back to our first time meeting each other. I think, ironically, uh, it might've been at one of Amir's events, uh, who is one of our, our panelists today. Uh, and I also am very excited about this conversation and I'm thankful, Melissa, for you and the team uh, letting us talk today a little bit about the state of innovation in the industry um, and where there are emerging opportunities. Uh, so I'll start by giving a little brief introduction of our panelists and then I'll tee up a quick question. Um, so we intended to have a broad uh, breadth of experience on this session so that we could get varying perspectives. Uh, so we have Amir Amidi, the Managing Partner of Travel and Hospitality Center of innovation at Plug and Play Tech Center out in Silicon Valley. Um, Amir and his team have been really the center point of innovation for, for many industries, but for the travel and hospitality space, um, they've been the magnet for, for bringing thought leaders from various parts of uh, the ecosystem into one place. And that has really created some amazing conversations, but it's really been a great place for startups to thrive. It gives them the insights they need to actually succeed in the industry. Um, so I think Amir is gonna talk about the state of innovation from that perspective. Um, we have Dan McCoy, the Chief Innovation Officer from TSA. Dan and I have been working together recently uh, as TSA's uh, looking broadly at innovation. I think one of the great things about Dan coming from Deloitte and, and uh, launching their Catalyst program is his desire to look at the ecosystem beyond the typical airport and, and airline engagement and, and identify this as a true seamless passenger opportunity. Uh, the idea that we can be working together to connect the dots, uh, but also to, to make meaningful change in the industry. Um, and then we sort of round off the conversation with Chris McLaughlin, uh, Executive Vice President of Operations, Dallas-Fort Worth, as Melissa mentioned. Chris and I worked together back in TSA days, uh, launching PreCheck. I was able to carry his bag from airport to airport as we rolled this out across the industry. But I think one other thing that Chris brings to this conversation is a very entrepreneurial spirit. Um, he has worked at uh, very successful uh, commercial companies, including one that recently went public this year um, and has run some of the biggest airports uh, right now, DFW, but also before this uh, COO at Denver International Airport. So um, with that background, let's dive in uh, and start with the state of the industry, um, trying to get a sense of where you see opportunities, where has the pandemic uh, impacted or even accelerated innovation, and where do you see us going from this point in time forward? Um, to start, uh, I wonder, if, Amir, if you'd be willing to give your perspective from the plug and play side. Thank you, Chris. Pleasure to be with all of you guys. Uh, uh, and thanks to SVIP for including me on this uh, super panel. Pleasure to be on the same panel with so many distinguished panelists. Um, you know, the state of the industry, it all depends on what lens you're looking through, Chris. So, you know, for domestic travel markets, you know, such as U.S., China, and more recently, India, again, I would say uh, suppliers and service providers that are dependent on domestic travel, primarily leisure travel, are doing okay. Uh, some are even temporarily at least doing better than pre-pandemic levels. 
But when you look at international uh, suppliers, you know, like carriers like AA or, or Delta or Singapore Airlines, they're suffering quite a bit. So international travel restrictions, uncertainty, flare-ups from, you know, uh, Delta variants, cases going up in certain markets has definitely kept international travelers at bay, be it leisure or business. Um, so the state of the industry, it all depends on where you've placed your chips or where you are placing your chips in the short term for uh, certain domestic markets, people are just fine. Uh, a lot of the larger players that rely on international travel are suffering quite a bit still, and they're far off pre-pandemic levels. Having said that, again, if you want to break it down further, uh, I would say, you know, leisure will come back. There's a lot of pent up demand, uh, and this is related to international travel. There's no question about it. Uh, I think once we get our house in order and people get real time information and states start working more closely together, to make sure there's no misinformation out there and guidelines don't change from day to day, people will build up their confidence and get on the plane and cross borders again for, for leisure travel. I tend to be a little bit more pessimistic on the business side, you know, as we are today talking on Zoom and as we have been for the past 18 months and as CFOs of large companies like Amazon have saved over a billion dollars in business travel and managed to grow in the meantime, I think business travel is going to be scrutinized a lot more. Um, some experts say it will come back, you know, in 2020, end of 2023. Some say they're going to wait till 2025. I have a question mark in my head if business travel will look the same ever. Um, so that is the lens that we're making decisions through right now. Uh, one quick follow-up, Amir. So you work extensively with startups in the travel industry, are you seeing uh, the rules of the game, the success criteria change in this environment? Uh, you know, how are they thriving, the ones that you work with? So there was, there was some house cleaning that took place, Chris. Uh, so the startups, and there's a lot of startups in the travel industry, uh, uh, but the ones that were working on nice to have projects have faded away naturally because they couldn't secure financing or they couldn't secure clients to uh, keep their business going. The startups that are thriving today are actually quite interesting, not just during the pandemic, I think for post pandemic era as well, they're working on really, really exciting projects. Um, so we actually accelerated our investments in the current market conditions because we believe you're gonna see a number of billion dollar plus travel companies come out of this pandemic. Uh, this year, we've invested in seven travel-related startups. We're going to close the year with another three investments at least uh, to cap it at 10 investments. Next year, if we have our uh, chips in the right place, we want to make at least 20 investments to take advantage of the current market conditions. That is our approach. Uh, I, I can't say that's the strategy that a lot of the investors who sometimes invest in travel and sometimes don't, the tier one VCs are taking. Um, but the capital infusion in travel did take a dip early on in 2020, uh, but it is making a comeback across the travel industry. So I think uh, it's actually a great time to be on the investment side. Another reason being that the valuations of these startups that are scaling fairly quickly are a little bit more reasonable than they were prior to the pandemic as well. So the investor's money goes further. That's fascinating. It sounds like you're, you're betting on the rebound of travel or, or the idea that it's a resilient industry uh, and, and that this actually is a, a buying opportunity, a way for us to, as you mentioned, accelerate emerging technologies. So that's great. And I was wondering if maybe that's a, tra a good transition over to Dan McCoy, uh, you know, TSA's chief innovation officer, uh, as you're taking a look at uh, the, the movement of passenger uh, numbers, in particular, uh, you know, the, the pandemic hit us uh, at the beginning of last year and, and the numbers obviously drip, dipped. I think we saw a bit of a rebound uh, domestically, as Amir mentioned. Um, but what does that mean for your innovation efforts? What are you seeing at the TSA level? Sure. Yeah, I look every day at those travel numbers. I think 
during the pandemic, um, I started, I always joke at two weeks flat in the curve. So my first day at TSA was May 8th, 2020, um, when we were all watching Tiger King and everybody was just on Zoom meetings with friends. So watching those numbers always change for us. It, it let us do two things and we'll continue to do that from an innovation perspective. So um, number one is, is it let us pull some stuff to the left. So when you think about emerging technology and in, in response to the pandemic, uh, we had already had a glide path to contactless. We had already had a really good glide path to a strong biometric backend, um, whether that's in partnership with a lot of um, emerging tech companies or in partnership with our, our group at CBP. We pulled all of that back to the left and said, first and foremost, right now, contactless is the most important thing for both passenger safety and officer safety. So we will continue to do that. And that is something that we are not um, decelerating from. We are continuing to drive that forward. If folks saw the announcement, the last announcement from Apple, not the one that wrapped up about five minutes ago, um, we have worked extensively with them and you know motor vehicle departments on digital identity and kind of building out that ecosystem as another back end to contact list. Uh, the second thing as well is, is the downturn in travel did give us the opportunity to do some testing um, and some, some kit installation without as much disruption as we normally would. So you saw a faster timeline for some midsize and some, some smaller size CT deployments. You saw some upgrades to our AITs as well. So all of that work was kind of brought on by decreased passenger volumes. And I think those, those items are here to stay um, as long as we see those diminished numbers. I think it, it's been fascinating to see the silver lining in the pandemic. Uh, yeah. You know, for people paying attention, there are um, some benefits to the pause. Um, and I think in some ways you refocus your efforts to your point about seamless travel. It's not a new thing. In fact, you nope. guys were working very deliberately on it. Um, and maybe you could expand a little bit about that, that Apple effort, which is really exciting. And I think it shows the expansion of the ecosystem and um, talk maybe a little bit more about biometrics as a. Uh, yes. Yeah, I can do a little bit. I'm sure somewhere at TSA, there's a lawyer's ears just burning, wondering what I'm doing right now. Um, so, you know, part of the coordination effort um, that was announced, we, we've been talking about really supporting um, that market development. So if you ask a lot of folks, and I don't have the survey data on this, so this is really qualitative here. Um, if you ask people, you know, when do you take it, your ID and why? And the first thing that really comes to their mind, often ahead of buying a drink or validating who you are with healthcare providers, a lot of people say TSA. So when you think about building in a market for digital identity and a great way that Apple works, right, is they kind of build the technology and then there's an ecosystem around it with third-party vendor parts and third-party accessories. This was one of the things where they realized, you know, if we're going to make a market impact, we need to go work with someone who's going to build that market and look no further than the 440 federalized airports in the United States. So I think that was a tremendous partnership opportunity for them and for us, right? We are on the cutting edge of something that we normally would kind of be a little bit laggard maybe in, in how we develop it. So upgrading some of our credential authentication tech to, to work seamlessly with that is really to the benefit of the passenger, but mainly, for security, right? It is a whole new level of identity proofing and vetting that we can bring together. Yeah, I, I think that's exciting. Uh, and I think it's excellent. It's just the start of this because yep. digital identity can be used across the ecosystem throughout the traveler journey. Um, and maybe that is one segue for, for Chris McLaughlin to sort of give a an airport's perspective on innovation broadly, but maybe even a little bit on the seamless passenger journey as well. Chris, you there? Yeah. Hey, uh, thanks for having uh, me today and happy to, to weigh in. Look, I, I want to actually start with the calendar, right? Because when we talk about a seamless journey and we talk about innovation and aviation, it's important to, to take note of the fact that it's the 14th of September, uh, 20 years uh, after 9-11. And uh, to, to really recognize that both in terms of uh, sort of honoring um, uh, what happened on that tragic date 
and then reflecting on all the work that thousands and thousands of men and women have done since then uh, to keep this industry so, that some would say is, you know, it's, ex, ex, it's, it's exciting to people, but it's also been fragile um, over the decades. And so all that work that's gone to keep this industry afloat really does, uh, does warrant our notice. Um, in terms of uh, where we are in, in innovation and the seamless experience, you know, what I would share is that our goal has all, always has been and will continue to be to make the travel experience as seamless as possible for customers as they transit. Frankly, we used to say from the curb to the gate. I would actually argue now it's from the couch um, to the curb on the backside of, of, of aviation. So the entire uh, journey that the customer goes through. And over the last 20 years, for good reasons, we've had to add layer upon layer upon layer to, to keep the system safe and secure. Uh, but as we do that, we also add complexity to the customer and friction into their experience. So one of the things that I would tell you that when we look at innovation, we think about what are the ways that we can keep that baseline level, um, that we can balance the need for uh, whether it's security in the perspective of threat or more recently safety with the perspective of health. How do we keep that balance with the real need to keep customers, leisure and business willing to make that journey? And it starts with, with innovation. Um, I love what I heard from Amir in the sense of uh, that that investment is is a realistic expectation right now because one of the things that I see with startups often is you know they, they startups want to build for today's problem because obviously they're they're in it to sort of uh, uh, make some money uh, but oftentimes the solutions that we need uh, aren't we're not able to build them right away so we start building a solution today that actually gets implemented tomorrow. The touchless uh, technology that Dan has referred to is a great example of that. We were talking about uh, cat technology 15, maybe 16 years ago. And the glide path, and I say this with love, Dan, because you know I've been there, right? Is the glide path that Dan refers to sounds really great, but oftentimes gliding isn't the problem. It's the landing that's the problem. And it's the pandemic that's helped us land. And so, you know, we at DFW are working very closely with with TSA on, on some of their, uh, I think, uh, some forward-leaning innovations, including uh, the, the biometric CAT opportunity. Uh, and, and I frankly don't think we'd be nearly as far as we are today without um, um, the silver lining, if you will, of the pandemic. Still work to do. And now the question is, how do we convert for, like we're literally at the five yard line. So how do we go from where we are um, into a space where it's actually up operational and working so that as traffic returns, the system is in place and functional before the volumes of passengers uh, returns. Yeah, um, I'm thinking to your, to your point about the passenger volumes being down and this also sort of being an opportunity. Dan, are you looking at uh, the screener experience in the context of the seamless passenger journey? I mean, what does it look like from, you know, Chief Innovation Officer's perspective of what the people on the ground at the airports are experiencing? Trying our best, right? This is something, um, when I came in, I really wanted to drive a focus. I always say internally, you know, TSA Innovation has no goal in and of itself. We are here to provide solutions and a framework to accelerate action to the field, to headquarters, to FAMS, anybody who wants to bring a new creative approach and, and maybe emerging tech forward approach to something um, we're here to support. So everything I'll say, right, is anecdotal from my traveling and, and some of my visits to the field uh, from when I started. And uh, I want to hit something that Chris said, right? So we are really accelerating these things forward and, and we're always trying to get this new technology and we're trying to get this experience better. Um, and I think we, TSA internally need to do a little bit better job kind of communicating what the changes are to our workforce. So I was in Vegas about two or three months ago, and we had a new cat machine um, in the pre-check line. And I asked our TSO, I said, how many times a day do you tell people they don't need to brandish their boarding pass anymore? And she said, every passenger, every single one. And I said, okay. How many times a day do you tell people it doesn't matter which way they put their ID into the machine, 
it will read it because we did some human center design. We understood, you know, having people line it up like a credit card at the gas station was not going to work. And she said every single passenger. So those type of things, those friction points that to Chris's point, we created, right? This is new and emerging security that is increasing our security baseline, but we did create some level of, of new friction for our officers. Um, we need to do a much better job thinking through that and supporting the front lines when we we tell them, hey, this new technology is coming out. Here's some signage that's going to be as you walk up. Here's kind of what you should say to passengers. And, you know, we did this for the benefit of you all. And we hope you guys feel that as well. Interesting. Um, and it is not a, a challenge. I think that's exclusive to the TSA checkpoint. I was wondering, Amir, if you see any parallels from a passenger experience perspective in, in the hospitality ecosystem more broadly, hotels, uh, other, other groups. Yeah. So let's talk about the contactless solutions. Uh, so uh, I believe contactless solutions were coming anyway, because it helps all the suppliers save money in the long run. Um, the ROI on them is relatively uh, uh, short. Uh, but I think the pandemic accelerated it because the market demanded it. Um, so a lot of attention was spent on it. One of those contactless solutions are bots. Um, so, you know, basically if a passenger has a question when they're flying out of SFO and that question could be answered by a bot without the passenger stopping at the information desk and taking time from the information officer and, and uh, taking time out of their schedule, I think is, is the best solution in the world. And, and bots have actually reached a point now with some training, not out of the box, but with some training that they could accurately answer north of 80% of the average passenger's question going through airports or at hotels. Um, so uh, I think contactless solutions are actually a great way to increase passenger satisfaction levels because they instantaneously get what they want without allocating much human capital resources to it. And I would also argue in the context of hospitality, it takes the level to a new, uh, it takes the service to a new level. Meaning if I check into uh, Fairmont, San Francisco, and, and I don't even know what local restaurants I should check out on day one or, or what I should get from room service, if the bot is intelligent enough to tell me things that, I, that, that the hotel thinks based on my loyalty, uh, status at that hotel and, and what they know about me, if the bot offers me things that I may not even know that I want or I may enjoy, I would argue that that hotel is serving me better than any other hotel. So I think bots in a context of contactless solutions are here to stay and they're becoming smarter and smarter. And it doesn't necessarily have to be taking away the human touch, uh, you know, because you're saving a few dollars here and there. I actually think bots can can complement uh, a human touch service, if you will, in context of hospitality and airports, and they could increase travelers uh, satisfaction levels. Um, so that's one area we've invested in and will continue to invest in. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Hey, uh, Chris, yeah, can I just add? Yeah. Sorry, sorry, I just want to add to that. I think that uh, what Amir is saying is, is really important is you know, early in the pandemic, we were thinking about things like 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 touchless because it was the safe thing to do. It kept humans safe from humans. Um, as we kind of move through the pandemic, our, our new challenge is the lack of humans, right? So one of the things that whether it's a bot or whether it's some other kind of autonomous technology, a couple of years ago, we might have been, well, I'm not sure. I don't I don't I, I, I miss that. No pun intended, but the, the human touch today is someone who who requires frontline support in an airport environment. Uh, the more automa automation that I can put in place, the better I can serve that consumer because labor, frankly, is very short right now. And so there's a, the, the next thing that I think we'll see through the, through the pandemic in terms of the need for innovation has to do with force multipliers and labor, which then I think goes exactly to Amir's point, which is, is ultimately improves the customer experience because they're getting what they want in real time um, without having to wait uh, uh, for, that, for that solution to come to them. And, and if Chris, I could, Chris, if I, I oh know, Amir, go, go ahead. No, no, you go first. I'll go after you. <laughs> I was going to shift off of bots really briefly because, as cause Chris said, force multiplier. So, you know, going back to what I had said before with supporting the workforce, 
Um, whether it's AI or new technology, one of the things we're always focusing on is how does it empower the officer? So I think when we all jumped on, right, we heard from synthetic and we heard from signal. And when we talk about image on alarm only and some of these, these new steps and to Chris's point about really these force multipliers, it is to drive a better experience and really reposition the officer's time to be more value add. So instead of scanning every single bag, you maybe only get uh, an image if there is an unknown item versus stream of commerce data. So that AI development, bot development, really what you can do with machine learning at this point, we're focused on bringing that as an augmentation to our frontline workers um, so that, again, we can hit that force multiplier effect. Sorry, Amir. No, no, I 100% agree. It doesn't have to be either or. I think the combination is where the true uh, value uh, creation is. But... You know, coming back to the topic of seamless journey, uh, Chris, you know, for me, and I'm putting my traveler hat on, not plug and play hat on. To me, a seamless journey is a journey that doesn't have surprises, at least negative surprises. It doesn't have disruptions, which is very hard to do because you're dealing with so many different players throughout your uh, travel journey. And all, everything is happening in the background without me being bothered with it. So we had a company... Uh, that went through our batch one accelerator program. This is back in 2016, which seems like a lifetime ago. Uh, it's a company called Kaniku, and they had built these microchip sensors uh, using organic material that could detect explosives um, passively. So meaning it could detect explosives, it could detect drugs, it could detect whatever could be a threat in a, in a secured area, be a cabin of an airplane or an airport. The vision this company had and still does today is that the passenger, and, and this is somewhat redundant, everybody has talked about this for over a decade, the passenger can go from the curb to the gate at walking pace without having been stopped and checked and bags being screened and, and questioned. Um, we once had a conference with Kevin McLean when he was uh, working for the government and, and the question I had for him, he, was, he gave a talk and then we had a Q&A session was, why does every passenger have to be guilty until proven innocent when 99.0% of the passengers going through through the airports don't have bad intentions? Can we reach a point where we actually switch the model with a certain level of certainty, obviously, without compromising security or privacy laws? And, and, and everybody's innocent until proven guilty. Uh, and we just you know single out the folks that are a threat to make this seamless travel journey a little bit better through airports and airplanes. We're not there yet, but I think, you know, if we work towards that goal, and I think it is possible in the future with, with the adoption of technology and digitalization, uh, to me, that's a true seamless passenger journey, that everything is happening seamlessly in the background without the passenger being stopped, questioned, interrogated, um, and you're not, guilty until proven innocent as soon as, you know, you want to board a plane or go through an airport environment or go through customs and immigration. Chris, I'm surprised you're not chiming in from the pre-check perspective, but. Uh... Yeah, no, I'm just, I'm, I'm nodding in agreement. Um, I, I, I think that's really, that's the art uh, that we're, that we're, you know, we're, we're always trying to, I think to, as, as a former boss of mine used to say, narrow the haystack so that we can, uh, focus our energy and time on the 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 things that need the most attention, um, and allow the freedom of movement for for people and 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 commerce, right? For the things that need the least attention, that's the balance. Dan, are you going to chime in? I I was waiting for Chris to chime in because I knew he had probably way more experience in this realm setting up pre-check. Um, but to the same point, right, a, a mere. Uh, when I came in, wide-eyed, bushy-tailed to this organization, that's kind of what I thought, right, is how do you look at a 79-year-old who travels back and forth between um, Manchester, New Hampshire, and the Villages, Florida, every year on a, a standard cadence, um, a.k.a. my grandmother? Um, how do you do that and know that that person has a, a lower risk threshold than, than somebody else who maybe doesn't fly? It gets a little tricky with um, kind of our background vetting and, and some of the legislation and 
our, our civil rights conversation. So it really is something that I always harken back to is it's hard to innovate in highly regulated industries sometimes. And you hit a very large friction point internally for us that we always think about. So it's in our heads. We're always considering it. And I know Chris and Chris can back me up on that. Um, and it's something that we look at with, with vetting. You know, one thing that does come to mind, um, Chris, were you going to chime in? I'm sorry. No, well, I just wanted to add this, this point. And, uh, and, and I, I actually want to say two things. One is I want to say, uh, Chris and Dan, you both have, have given me way too much credit for PreCheck. I was a member of a great team of people that put PreCheck together, and, and it took a lot of different people thinking it through. And frankly, um, with the exception of Chris Rundy, none of us were special. Who we were were people that answered the call um, with existing technology and existing policies and procedures, and essentially made a, a, a risk-based decision in a time of what I would argue was almost crisis. It was a period after the underwear bomber and during a, a period when TSA was in the press repeatedly for unfortunate incidents with children or veterans or, or other situations that, that was causing a great amount of scrutiny. And so we, uh, we, we did what we had to do to restore, to reduce friction and restore some seamlessness and we did it without new inventions. We did it by adjusting all the things that we often think government gets stuck in, which is policy decisions. But in certain moments in time under certain leaders, and I would give John Pistol this credit, uh, we were able to do extraordinary things because we had the will to do it. And I think that's one thing that I want us to be thinking about as we move forward through this pandemic is some of the things we can put technologies in place, solutions in place. But if we don't do them differently, if we don't actually, it's the, it's the Henry Ford uh, adage that if I asked people what they wanted, they would have just asked for a faster horse instead of a different solution. And so my encouragement is to say, let's put the things in place, but then let's actually make sure the processes that go with the things allow us to be the most effective as possible for the people that are coming through our systems. Yeah, that's exactly right, Chris. Um, and I'm getting a, a gentle nudge from the organizers to transition to Q&A. So we're going to go ahead and do that. I'm looking at the submitted questions. And I, uh, the first one is around sovereign identity. Um, and I think that's a really interesting topic. And in fact, it was something I was going to ask Dan about based on a conversation we had. And it spurred because of the Apple conversation today, you know, they create an ecosystem for innovators to go off and do whatever they're going to do, right? They have AR kit, uh, they, they create playing fields for innovation. Um, and I'm wondering if that's another area or a silver lining of this is, is there a greater demand or willingness for airports, airlines, DHS to start, start sharing data? Uh, you know, are there ways for that to spur innovation? Uh, Dan, do you have any thoughts on that? So it, I, Right before this call, I actually had a call with our, our chief data officer at, at TSA, um, and you hit the nail on the head, right? Both at DHS headquarters and internally to TSA, um, we kind of hit that inflection point, right? We can't treat data as exhaust. This is a, an asset that we can provide to the ecosystem, whether it is, um, again, hearkening back to the companies we just heard from some DICO standard image sets with stream of commerce so that we can get some third-party algorithm development, whether it's passenger throughput data. And when we talk to you know, United, American, and Delta, they don't want real-time wait time. They want historical wait times. They want to be able to tell their passenger, hey, you know, historically, if you were going to make a 215 out of DCA, you should probably leave within the next 25, 30 minutes. Um, here's a direct API into Lyft, Uber, whoever our travel partner is. So we're taking a look at that. Um, unfortunately, right now, right, the cyber conversation is really interesting. So TSA is um, one of the lead agencies for pipeline. The colonial pipeline definitely was something that we became hyper fixated on and, and will continue to shape us going forward. So when we talk about 5G, IoT, and this kind of proliferation of endpoints of new connected devices, um, and even our traditional OT, 
we really have to build in cyber resiliency from the jump because, um, you know, Chris and prep for this, right? When we talked about what the outlook for the next few years is, I think we'll see a growth in, in cyber attacks on the transportation sector, just like we did with, with pipeline. And we have to be ready for that. Um, so sharing data, making sure that we're reporting the same things, cross sharing, you know, types of incidents that are attempted all within the ecosystem is going to be incredibly important. And I think that's where TSA kind of sits at the head of the table. Amir, do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, uh, this to me ties back to your concept of seamless travel and, and reducing the friction, but it, it does require some communication between the various entities, right? It does. Uh, you know, one of the mysteries, at least in my head, uh, has always been why isn't there a closer collaboration between airports and airlines? And, and I've come up with a few of my theories over the years, but imagine how much we can enhance the traveler's journey if airports and airlines work closer together, whether that's sharing data. Airlines do not share, as far as I know, Chris, I could be wrong, but airlines do not share their data with airports. As far as Amir is arriving at this time, he's getting on this plane, he's returning on this date. But imagine a simple thing like that without compromising privacy laws. Uh, if, if the airline was sharing that data with Chris's airport, how much better his airport could serve me while I'm going through the terminal, whether it's you know on the land side or air side. When we were prepping for this uh, 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 panel, you know the other thing we talked about is never waste a good crisis, and nothing brings people closer together than a common enemy. In this case, is this pandemic. I really think if we uh, just look through a different lens and say it's time for us to work more closely together without compromising our business models or margins, which I think there's a lot of room for that. It's a great time for airports, airlines, hotels, TMCs, travel agencies to work more closely together with that ultimate goal of a seamless travel journey. Um, the other point I wanted to make, Chris, and I know we may be running short on time that we haven't talked about today, is how all of us in the travel industry need to worry about the environment a lot more than we have been in the past. This is no wrong, longer about uh, regulation. This is no longer about, uh, I think, uh, customer demand. You know, we are in trouble. And I think the travel industry gets more slack than it deserves, but we are part of the problem. And at least in our ecosystem, we work with about 30 travel suppliers globally Everybody is trying to come up with a business model that doesn't compromise that margins. In fact, we're looking at some models that increases margins, but also doesn't negatively impact the environment as much. So I just wanted to bring that up because it's a topic all of us should seriously be thinking about uh, before if it's too late, if, if, and it may be too late by now. Um, I think... Chris, you have worked at an airline in addition to being at TSA, in addition to running an airport. You know, what do you think to that big question Amir put out there about uh, yeah. airlines not sharing data or you know, the, the barriers? Sure. So I, I and again, not to not to make this all about pre-check, but I would actually tell you that one of the one of the only way that pre-check worked was because very early in the process we got agreement first from Delta and American and then subsequently from United and others. Um, to, to join us in the fight. And without that integration, PreCheck could not have uh, launched successfully. So again, what I would say is um, there are times when we can come together as an industry uh, to share enough data uh, to allow us uh, to, to, to move forward. I, I think there's ways for that to increase. I also think there's ways for um, the TSA, the federal government and the airlines to share the data back and forth and then only give entities like airports um, the end information that we need to make the process flow. So for example, I just, I'd like to know what time um, uh, to have enough staff at Starbucks so that nobody's getting a cold cup of coffee, right? Or I guess no one's waiting for a cup of coffee. And so I don't need to know whether 80% of those passengers are United or Delta. I don't need to know how much they paid for their ticket. I don't need to know their status. I just need to know when they're gonna be in the Starbucks line. Right or or how many of them are going to park or how many of them are connecting and so I do think there's ways for us to get there. Um, I also think that in this conversation the airline plays a critical role 
Airports are single entities spread out around countries and continents. Airlines fly between countries and continents and there's fewer of them. And so making sure that we keep them central to the conversation is really important. I saw that Paul from DFW asked a question. So as long as it's not gonna put me on the spot, you know, that's okay. Yeah, there's, uh, there's some additional questions as well. And I, I'm being conscious of the time. I think we have about three minutes left. The, the, there are questions about DICOS imagery and SSI. And I think those may be better for follow-ups. Um, the one that resonated with me and I think is a, a good closing one is uh, someone was recognizing the risk management uh, approach that the banking industry has deployed for years and, and wondering, uh, you know, what are their parallels to aviation and, and are there ways for us to lean into that as a model? Um, I, I think that's a rich question. I'm wondering who from the panel would like to take a stab at that. I wouldn't dare with the other distinguished panelists take a stab <laughs> at that. So I'll leave it up to Chris and Dan. Chris, I'm going to walk myself into a minefield here. So maybe you can help me fish me back in a second. So to answer the question, I always like to do these and genuinely answer these questions. Um, we talk a lot internally about what is a uniquely governmental function versus what is something that we can kind of expand. So the conversation around vetting is a uniquely governmental function. So background checks, things along that nature, what we do with secure flight. When we talk about identity verification in the same way that you call uh, Chase or City or Amex, and you say, this is my elementary school, and you have that pre-plan and you go through some type of some verification. Um, it has been discussed what that would look like in a TSA environment, but I can't say much further than that because I can't say that I've been in many of those conversations. So I know it is a topic of conversation. However, I don't have much more to, to yield on that. Well, and so, so look, I can just add very quickly, and I don't, I actually can't add a lot because Dan, candidly, I'm not sure uh, it's, it's been a while since I've been in the space, but I would just say that um, when we talk about things being inherently governmental, the, the comment that I would make, and, and you said earlier that the lawyers are going to be wringing their hands, they certainly will when I say this, um, is that government oversight is one thing. Uh, who and what is doing the work is another. I'm actually sitting outside another conference right now where one of the key speakers uh, earlier today was talking about the fact that in some cases, when you rely on automation, you actually get uh, uh, better results than when you uh, are relying on, on humans. So some things like passenger identification and verification, I would actually argue um, we have tools that may be more consistent, faster, and better than humans, not that the humans are bad, but that the tools the humans have aren't as good as the technology that's sitting in front of them. So inherently governmental, I would take an E-gate and a BCAT um, over, over a TSO that has uh, their eyes and a blue light any day of the week. Yeah, and I think that's another rich topic uh, that we, we will explore in our next session together. But Amir, I think there are uh, innovations happening in other industries that can make their way over to aviation, uh, like autonomy, uh, because the reality is there are things robots and uh, computers can do better than humans. Um, and frankly, most of those jobs are not fun for humans to do anyway. So let them do the things. That's the essence of, I think, risk-based security is let's deploy our resources more intelligently. Um, and with that said, I want to thank you guys so much for being part of the panel. I hope we get a chance to do this again. Uh, Melissa, thank you for allowing us to participate and share some thoughts. Uh, and with that, I will hand it right back over to you to close it out.